I'm Longworth and welcome to another edition of Try It Today. Coming to you once again from our home away from home, the Cena Botanical Garden in Kernersville. We'll tell you more about them later on in the program. Later on, as a matter of fact, is when the roundtable shows up and we'll get into all sorts of controversial topics, so stay tuned for that. But between now and then, some great guests and important information to get to you, including a discussion about colorectal cancer. We'll also talk about domestic violence and other things, so stay with us. But first, we turn our attention to electric vehicles, buses specifically, and we do it with two good friends of the show on my immediate right. Hannah Cochran is Director of the Department of Transportation for the City of Greensboro. She was here many years before. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Socially distanced behind us is our good buddy, Davis Montgomery, is District Manager for Local Government and Community Relations for Duke Energy. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Um, all right, let's start out with you, Davis. Uh, you know, the, the popularity of EVs is just growing and growing. And so my question to you is, uh, what is Duke Energy's official involvement in and interest in electric vehicles? Um, the governor's energy plan, a big portion of that in controlling greenhouse gases is around transportation. Uh, so Duke Energy has been involved with converting to electric vehicles for some time now, working with the city of Greensboro and others. Uh, we are actually going to convert about 7,000 of our 10,000 vehicle fleet to electric vehicles by 2030. So wow. we think it's an important part of where the uh, where the country's going. And you gave a grant, I don't think I'm misspeaking, you gave a grant to Hannah's department in the city of Greensboro and that went for what, charging stations or? They, Greensboro was one of the first cities on the on the east coast to convert to electric buses and uh, they, for the very first one we were able to help out with the charging station for that bus. Hannah, tell me about your association with Duke Energy. Now let's just pretend that Davis isn't here right now. <laughs> And let's brag on him and, sure. and Jimmy Flyth and all the great guys over there. But no, no, seriously, what, what's been the relationship there in helping you get going where you need to be? Sure. So Greensboro Transportation has had a decades-long relationship with Duke Energy um, from the days when Duke Energy was operating our public transportation services. Which a lot of people don't realize. Right. Back in the day, yep. you know, it was Duke Energy running the, the city buses. Right. For more than 100 years, Greensboro was operating, more than 100 years ago, Greensboro was operating an electric shuttle system over 10 miles. It had a number of vehicles that were then converted to electric trolleys isn't and then buses. We, isn't it weird how we get rid of things like that? And right, then and then they come back. back. Hey, I've got an idea. <laughs> why, now, why the emphasis in, in your department on the, the city buses particularly? So city buses really make up an important part of our fleet of vehicles at the city of Greensboro. They um, are a big part of our fuel costs and they make up a large contribution to the air quality conditions in the city. So the conversion to electric vehicles that have zero emissions, that have a really quiet operating system and provide uh, operational efficiencies for us was a really um, smart investment, not just an environmentally sustainable one. Yeah, and it's got to have a big impact on, on the environment because just the air quality, if you've ever been around a bus and you have, we all have, sure. you know, where they put out all these fumes and everything. Now, are all of the city buses now electric or a portion of them or what? It's a portion of our fleet. Uh, we have 16 electric bu buses that are currently operating and we have an order for another um, electric bus from the same manufacturer. And we're looking forward to uh, seeking additional grant funds and investments as we convert the entire fleet to electric. What does the future hold beyond that for electric vehicles in the city of Greensboro? What, what do you think? Well, we're really uh, invested in the future of electric vehicles. We, as we construct new off-street parking, our new parking deck that is opening very shortly has uh, charging infrastructure in it wow. from the very get-go. Um, as we build additional off-street parking, we intend to um, set it up so it has electric charging stations available and the ability to convert up to 50% of those spaces to charging. I just think that's great. And of course, you need to make sure you've got an engraved plaque on each charging station that says, thanks to Davis Montgomery. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> up on no, no, all right. Up on screen, a couple of things. The Department of Transportation. You can visit their website at greensboro-nc.gov backslash departments backslash transportation, and also please visit duke-energy.com is their major website. And in 10 seconds, Davis, I know you're pleased about where this is all headed. Absolutely. Um, I think it's the right direction and the right involvement. We're going to form a consortium of states in the southeast that have electric charging stations so you don't have that range anxiety. So it, this is a movement that's getting some momentum. I think that's great. Thanks for doing this, y'all. Our pleasure. Thank all right. You. 
We'll be right back after this. Oh, back now on Triumph today. I'm looking at Triumph Over Abuse. It's a new book by a good friend of ours who's been on the show before. It's by Christine Murray. She's with us now. She's director of the Center for Youth, Family, and Community Partnerships at UNCG. Thanks for bringing the book and thanks for being here. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, serious topic of domestic violence, domestic abuse. What's the main message of the book? Well, the main message of this book is really that survivors, even though they've been through a traumatic, difficult experience of having been abused, that they can recover, that it can be a lengthy process, um, but that better days can be ahead for them. Now, this may seem, sound like a weird question, but since we've gone through this pandemic and we're still in it, has that affected negatively or otherwise uh, a, a victim's ability to heal the way he or she would want? Well, I think it's gonna take a long time to see what the lingering effects of the pandemic are for survivors of abuse, but certainly the increased isolation that people have experienced, possibly financial stress or additional stressors that people are facing can really compound some of those long-term traumatic effects of abuse. What are some of the challenges that a victim of domestic abuse faces in trying to heal? Well, it's difficult to rebuild your life after abuse while you're also dealing with the day-to-day -day, um, stressors and demands, even in normal times, but especially right now during the pandemic. So um, a lot of survivors face mental health symptoms or challenges. Um, there might be ongoing custody issues and concerns, especially if they share children with their former abuser. Um, also really overcoming some of that isolation and building new social support systems and rebuilding connections with other friends or family members that it, they might have lost touch with during the relationship. Now, in what ways can friends and family support someone who is trying to do ongoing, and maybe that's the wrong term, ongoing healing from domestic abuse that's happened recently or way in the past, either one. What, what can friends and family do? I think that one of the most important things that friends and family can do to offer support is just to be a really consistent, non-judgmental source of validation and encouragement along that journey. Um, and I think it's also important for friends and family members to know their limitations. And if you, especially if you're not a trained professional to deal with mental health or trauma, domestic violence, learn about some of the resources in the community that you could help connect your loved one to. Absolutely, and, not, and just to paraphrase, and hope I don't do this incorrectly, but one section of the book you were talking, I think you said something like, uh, your oldest friends are not necessarily the ones that are always gonna be the most supportive. And they may not mean anything by that, but like you said, they may not be capable of giving you the support you need, and therein lies the reason for finding resources like uh, this book. I'm going to hold it up again in just a minute as well. Uh, what kind of hope can you share with folks that may be watching now and going through everything that they've gone through and maybe are going through? Um, what hope can you share for their healing process? Even if you've been through some really difficult times in your life, you can heal from that. You can overcome and you can experience a beautiful, wonderful future ahead. Um, and it can take work and it can be a difficult process to recover from it. But if you lean into your support network, if you learn about that healing process and be intentional about the work that you're doing, that you're, the rest of your life doesn't have to be defined by the abuse that you've experienced. Right, you know, and, and the thing I always hate to hear some people say is, uh, and we didn't rehearse this, but I just, you know, you're, you're here and I thought I'd just mention it. You've heard it many times before. Somebody said, well, if, if she's in a, an abusive relationship, just tell her to get out. It's not that easy. There's a lot of reasons why somebody ends up staying in an abusive relationship. Um, leaving an abusive relationship can be the most dangerous time to leave that, that relationship. Because it so could escalate. It could definitely escalate, so it's important, especially at that time, to reach out for professional support um, to local resources or the National Domestic Violence Hotline. All right, now up on screen, I want to do a couple things here. One, for your department where you take you, you handle all these kind of things, and it's cyfcp.uncg.edu, which of course stands for Center for Youth, Family, Community Partnerships, the general website, uncg.edu. I'm going to hold the book up again to remind myself that you can get this on Amazon, and I'm assuming some other places, Triumph Over Abuse by Christine Murray. It's a great book. I recommend it. And I just thank you for all the work you're doing. Well, thanks so much for all your support, Jim. We appreciate it. Well, we're proud of you. All right, we'll be right back after this. And to try it today, this is, I believe, Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, so it's appropriate that we bring in an expert in the field to help us understand more about this terrible disease. But a great guest next to me, our good friend, Dr. Garish Mishra, Chief of the Section of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Wake Forest Baptist Health, also 
I'm told, executive director of the Digestive Health Service Line. You wear a lot of hats over there, and I'm glad you're here today. Thanks for being here. Well, you have more titles when you don't have a whole lot of substance. That's what they <laughs> say, I think. Yeah, I need more titles. That's what, <laughs> uh, Doc, let's get serious for a second about this colorectal cancer uh, topic. And uh, how prevalent is this disease nowadays? Right, it, it's very common, and I think as a gastroenterologist, the, the hardest thing is we feel like it's pretty much preventable in most cases. So if you look at the statistics, roughly 150,000 uh, individuals are afflicted with colorectal cancer. Um, and taking a step back, a lot of folks get confused. Is it rectal cancer? Is it colon cancer? What's the difference? Really, it's the same pathology. It's colon cancer, but if in, it involves the part of the colon called the rectum, then it's rectal cancer. Gotcha. Biologically, they behave a little bit differently, but screening-wise and detection, it's the same. Um, how, so, do you, how do you know early on, because I've heard horror stories about people that don't get checkups, don't get screenings, and by the time they see some severe symptoms, it's too late to really help them the way they need the help. Uh, but what are some early signs, or are there none? No, there, there can be. Um, most colon cancers arise from what we call polyps. These are growths, uh, and patients will ask me, well, what causes a polyp? That's a very intriguing question, but we know that certain patients are predisposed to polyps, and it runs in families. So the beauty or how or why colon cancer is so preventable is if you catch it at the polyp stage, and remove the polyp, then you prevent someone from getting colon cancer. So that's why we do these screening tests. Uh, in terms of symptoms, yes, you could be totally asymptomatic, and that's why the current recommendations are at age 50, an asymptomatic individual, but a little bit sooner if one has symptoms or a family history. Family history, go get a, col a colonoscopy earlier on, and if not around age 50. Now, what, what does screening requirements exist right now? Right, there's several sort of broad categories of screening, what one we call the stool-based test, and, and the other are sort of procedures or optical, how you actually look inside the colon. Now the stool-based tests are, what we, uh, there's several types. The old version was what called a guaiac or a card. There's a more recent, which is called a FIT test, which is an immunochemical assay. Right. With those stool-based tests, you have to repeat it quite frequently, almost on a yearly basis. And if it's positive, then you turn around and need a colonoscopy. Right. Whereas a colonoscopy, if you, you get at age 50 or earlier, sooner, if one has a family history, and it's clean, for the most part, you can repeat that procedure in 10 years or five years if one has a family history of colon cancer. Your department uh, seems to be, and forgive me if I misstate this, but you seem to be pretty, not just well suited, but particularly suited for doing these kinds of screenings and dealing with this. I mean, is there a reason why you guys have achieved that, that uh, level? Well, I would say the screening aspect is done at a lot of places, so I, I, I don't want to come here and say that we are the best at screening. We certainly screen and try to put the whole patient in context. So it's a continuum in terms of a multidisciplinary approach, and that gets bantered around a lot. What does a multidisciplinary approach mean? Well, here you have most likely a gastroenterologist that's doing the procedure. Right. We have colorectal surgeons. So a lot of surgeons operate on the colon and, and deal with colon cancer. At Wake Forest Baptist, we have individually specifically trained surgeons that deal just with colorectal. We have radiation oncologists. Again, there's radiation oncologists uh, throughout our entire region, but right. we have folks that are focused just on colorectal or rectal cancer. Same thing with oncologists. In addition, we have the whole research aspect. So um, there's great work being done at what we call our organoid lab, where they're actually taking tissue and seeing that tumor, what, is, what that tumor is most responsive to, which type of chemotherapy. Right. So that's the beauty of an academic center is we're constantly learning, teaching, and trying to do what's best for our patients. Well, I think it's, I think it's a great approach up on screen, wakehealth.edu, which we hope people will visit to get all sorts of information about what's going on. And please uh, follow the advice, if you would, uh, that uh, the doc was talking about and get the screenings and do it early. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming by and talking about this. Well, I certainly appreciate this opportunity, Jim. And, and for us as gastroenterologists, it, it just 
gets us to the core whenever we diagnose or if we lose an individual from colon cancer because it is preventable. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Major. We'll be right back. Right today and throughout the pandemic, as in even normal times, uh, finding a job can sometimes be difficult, and we have good news for those of you who are job seekers. We have a lovely lady with us who's been with us on the show before. Jesus has got some news about how you can seek those jobs. Sarah Butner's with us. She's communications manager for Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. Welcome back. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you sent me an email about something called Career Quest, and then there was something that says webinars. Of course, you know me for a long time. I, I don't, I'm not very technically oriented, but I think I know what a webinar is. So what is this Career Quest and webinar? What is that all about? Sure. Well, Career Quest is a monthly free webinar series that gives job seekers an opportunity to uh, hear directly from um, professionals in industries like manufacturing or hospitality, healthcare. A lot of job seekers are considering switching careers because of the pandemic if they've been under underemployed for a long time, right. um, but they may not know if it's a brand new career, how to get their foot in the door or uh, what opportunities are out there. So we have a professional from one of those fields come on the webinar every, every month and uh, they talk a little bit about uh, what that industry is really like, um, what the career paths are, and, uh, give, and the people who are on the webinar also have an opportunity to ask questions. And so they really get that one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction and that behind the scenes look at, at that particular industry. I think it's a great idea. I mean, at first, it's an introduction to that particular industry and the way they operate, as you said. And also you make a connection, you're networking, right? Absolutely. Um, we've had uh, some of the people who've attended the webinars contact uh, and follow up with the employers afterward. Uh, so it really does benefit both the job seeker and the employer because as the job seeker, you get an opportunity to learn about careers that you may not have been aware of. Um, if you are unfamiliar with an industry, if you've never worked in it, you may have a lot of preconceived ideas about, for instance, what it's like to work in manufacturing. Sure. Uh, so. Un uncovering this whole new avenue of career paths that you didn't know about is a big benefit to the job seeker. It also benefits the employers uh, because they get an opportunity to really talk up their industry, um, particularly if you've been struggling to recruit people. Yeah, great um, recruiting tool. So it's a big issue right now for a lot of employers. Yeah, I want to ask you about some of the topics. Uh, give, give me a couple examples of topics. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if, if an employer is, is, is talking to the folks in the webinar, What's an example of a couple topics that he or she might mention? Well, generally, we ask employers to talk about um, the field in general and um, what it's like to uh, to get involved, to get your foot in the door. For instance, do you need special certification or additional education, or can you just start right away? Uh, recently, we had a, a couple of representatives from a manufacturer talk about uh, the quality management concept, which is a big driver in manufacturing these days. There's a whole set of careers in manufacturing that deal with quality management. Right. Um, then they're high skill, usually high paying careers with a lot of advancement. And if you have a preconceived idea of what a manufacturing career is, you'd have no idea that that existed. Uh, our next webinar coming up on March 25th is on non-clinical careers in the medical field. Okay. Which, you know, if you think about it, you think of the medical field, you know, doctors, right. nurses, clinicians, right. but there's a whole range of careers, administration, professional support roles in any medical facility that you may not think about. And so they're gonna come on and talk about that. What kind of response have you had to these so far? The response has been great. Um, people really appreciate getting to talk to someone who's uh, on the inside uh, because you know you can read job descriptions, you can read about a profession, but getting to talk to someone who's worked in that field about how they got started and uh, what their path has been and getting to ask them questions has is just so so much more valuable. It makes it more personal. You know, I agree. I agree because just a form or an application or a piece of paper just doesn't cut it. Up on screen, uh, if you want more information about career quests and the webinars, careers by goodwill.org backslash career dash quest. Of course, the general website is goodwillnwnc.org. Uh, but please check that out and you can learn more about what Sarah was, uh, was talking about with these webinars. I just applaud what you're doing and uh, keep it up and keep me updated. Absolutely. All right, Sarah Butner. We'll be right back. Back now on Tried Today, just about time for the round table, but a quick shout out again to the good folks here at the Senior Botanical Garden. SeniorBotanicalGarden.org is the website which I hope you'll visit and visit the garden. It's a great place. We appreciate their hospitality. 
And uh, now to the round table on my right, but always political left, Ogie Overman, the great broadcaster and journalist, socially distanced behind him, our two favorite guys, Don Martin. Dr. Don Martin is also, among other things, vice chair of the Forsyth County Commissioners and Keith Granberry's founder of Helping Hands Consultants. Guys, have an education question, and this one is a little bit complicated. Guilford County Schools are about to award a $300 million contract to one of four businesses who have made the final cut to manage new construction projects. Now, two of the uh, finalists are locally based. My questions are, should the contract go to a local company, number one? And number two, shouldn't the contract have been broken up into smaller contracts so that more local companies could have bid on pieces of it? Ogie. Well, uh, Dr. Don is the expert on this. Real, let me ask you a question. Could you have your general contract, whoever has the best bid, regardless of local or not. You should get it. But couldn't the, the subs have a little uh, codicil in there that says you have to hire X number of subcontractors I think they could. to, you know, the carpenters, electricians. They all have subs that they're going to have. Gonna something. Have. Yeah, Don. Yeah, yes. The, if you're going to have a construction manager, if... Um, probably spending, uh, you're looking at rule of thumb for construction managers, 2%, two, $300 million worth of work, that's $6 million worth of work. If you're going to, and the, and the managers, by the way, Ogie, will hire, they'll bid projects, they're still going to bid them, yeah. there'll be lots of local work, all that'll happen. But the big, big management part is a management fee. And, and if you, so it, all four of those companies, I guarantee you can do it. So the question becomes, if you could get a quarter of a percent shaved off of that fee, you're going to save about, you know, 750 grand. But you were telling us off camera that when you were superintendent of one with Scythe County Schools, you had four different individuals who could manage contracts like this, which save money. Guilford doesn't have any of those kind of people on staff, so they have to pay a fortune just to have the contract managed, right? That's exa well, exactly. Now, the, the contract manager will tell you he brings more to bear to the table. He brings value engineering. Right. But, well, schools are fairly simple buildings, yeah. so value engineering is not quite as important. Keith, any thoughts? I, I think you should expand it. I think there should be uh, something that usually there isn't, and that's minority contractors mm -hmm. getting opportunities to bid on these and be the major contractor, not just the minority contractors. Right. At whether they're local or oh, regional, still exactly. have a minority component. All right. Uh, some lawmakers are asking Congress, federal lawmakers are asking Congress to waive taxes on 2020 unemployment benefits. So if you received, you know, you're out of work all through 2020, you were getting unemployment payments, you're supposed to pay taxes on that. But these congressmen are saying, let's try and waive those. What do you think, Ogie? Yeah, I'm okay with that. If, you've, if you're getting unemployment, it means you've already lost your job. You're already hurting already. Give them a little more break. That's no problem. Don. Well, I, I, you know, unemployment's been around before the pandemic, and, I, and it's always been taxed. So I, I'm in favor of taxing it. But the stimulus packages, the stimulus money, I'm, I'm not in favor, and I think that's the plan, not to tax it. All right, Keith. I'm not in favor of taxing. People are losing their shirts. They need every dime they can receive. And right now you have a lot of homelessness going on and, and a lot of people losing their jobs. So the, any amount of money they get, it should go in their pockets. If we ever do get a stimulus, another stimulus check, we'll see what happens there. A group of conservative North Carolina legislators introduced a bill, this is weird, that would permit people to carry concealed weapons onto private school campuses so long as there are church services being held on the private school campus. <laughs> Good idea or bad idea, Ogie? They'll stop at nothing to be able to carry guns, won't they? This gun, what has it come to, Jim? Jesus. People can, they're already letting people carry them into I churches mean, and, and certain public. pack heat in church? Private school campuses, churches. Well, I, I, the private schools, I think, I think the way the statute's written, those private schools will be closed. And so I suspect that it's already happening that people who, who conceal carry into churches are walking across the school parking lot. Already and that's happened. probably exactly why that law got generated. I think Gogi's point is, if you're going to allow people to, to carry in a church, then maybe, you know, and the, and the school's closed, it probably doesn't matter. Key, why would you be carrying a gun in a, at a church anyway? I mean, what's the purpose of that? You pray that you don't get shot, I guess. I, I mean, if you got security, that's one thing, but carrying a gun is another thing. There should not be guns on any school property. There should not be guns at church unless you're security. I agree. Meanwhile, the State General Assembly is considering whether to spend $42 million to renovate the Stevens Center in Winston-Salem, which is owned by the UNC School of the Arts. Guys, should taxpayers foot the bill for this kind of project, or should the funds be raised privately? Ogie. I'm happy to pay my fair share to support the arts, whether it's public, private, whatever. 
we need to support the arts. Period. They do public-private partnerships on baseball parks and other things, Don. I mean, what do you think? Yes, I, I agree. In fact, just as you build a new um, science building on the UNCG campus, this is a this is a part of the UNC uh, University of North Carolina of the Arts. Key. It's a facility. Forty-two million dollars to renovate the theater. I, I, just, I think at this time with what we have going on now, I, I'm not, I don't know if that's a that's a, a, a way to, to, uh, to look, use our money at this, at this present time, but I do support the arts. All right, final census data was supposed to be available next month. Now it won't be completed until September. So the head of the State Board of Elections says we should delay the 2022 primaries from March to May. That includes a really contentious U.S. Senate race probably. Good idea or bad idea? Quickly, Ogie. I don't understand, Jim. If it's not until September, what good does it do to change it from March to May, it's still the census won't be completed anyway. Well, they've got, no, but they're saying they won't get the figures till this September, and then that gives them time to get ready for oh, a primary set, next, well, yeah. Still, I, I, it's a statewide race. Quickly, Don. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with moving it. I'm fine with moving that because it does, it, it opens up a longer period of campaign. Key. Well, I, I, what I'm not fine with is the redistricting so that they can cut these districts so that uh, uh, minorities don't have an opportunity to have power to vote. And, and they're doing that all over the different states. And, they are. and in Georgia, they have 91 bills on suppressing the vote. And this I want is a to, terrible idea. I want to do Absolutely that. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, I want to talk about voter suppression next week, too. Finally, guys, a motorist in California has been fined for putting a mannequin in his passenger seat so that he can drive in the carpool lane. Guys, have you ever ridden in a car with a dummy, Ogie? I've been to dummy. I, <laughs> I used to be Earnhardt and everybody else was swerving <laughs> Irving. <laughs> Don, have you ever driven with a dummy? I try to make a practice not to, but probably some of the people who ride with me think they've ridden that, with them. Yeah, yeah. Keith, have you ever driven with a dummy? No, I'm so smart, I, I, don't, I don't ride with dummies. <laughs> you don't ride with any dummies. All right, so none of these guys are, none of these guys are gonna be in the carpool lane. Well, that's all the time we have, oh, except for this. By now, you've probably heard that the Hasbro Toy Company, because of being sensitive to gender identification issues, will now no longer call Mr. Potato Head, Mr. Potato Head. They're just gonna say, Potato Head. It's upsetting, said Spud Webb. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, used oh, to play no, basketball no, no, for no, NC no. State, Spud, his name is yeah. Spud. Yeah. All right, for all of us here, I'm Jim Longworth. We're going to go get in the car with some dummies. We'll be, see you next week.